Dr. Heisch, uh, given your previous role as director of the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School's Cancer Institute and also your current role as global head of Johnson Research and Development, you are ideally positioned to comment on the translational research continuum in cancer care. What do you think you're currently doing right and what do you think are the main opportunities and challenges that you see? Sure. So thanks for the question, V. Um, I think the most important thing we can't lose focus of, and I know that we don't, is that there's been a massive investment in cancer research over the last 40 plus years. In the U.S., it's been since the signing of the National Cancer Act by Richard Nixon in 71. Um, But all over the world, um, people see cancer as a huge uh, medical problem uh, that takes its toll on lives and pain and suffering. And this investment in fundamental cancer research has led to a perhaps a deeper understanding of the diseases that we call cancer, perhaps as well as or even better than most diseases that that affect mankind. So that fundamental investment has to continue. And the ability to go from a discovery and convert that into something that is within the practice of medicine, which we have called translational research, um, is in many ways, what I realize now, in many ways, the important role that the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industries play. And perhaps the most important thing is that in academics, where discoveries are usually made, the ability to turn those discoveries into a product is very limited. The ability to talk about clinical relevance, however, within an academic center is very important because that's where we usually have the disease experts, the breast cancer experts, the leukemia experts, the lymphoma experts. So I think, specifically to your question, what we've done really well is made fundamental discoveries, uh, but there's still a huge amount more we have to learn and to understand how those discoveries fit into specific types of cancer, that's really where I think in in the academic world uh, we should be focused. And then making the products should be the purview of uh, pharmaceutical and biotechnology industries. And do you think we need to look at a slightly different model as to how academia and industry interact? Well, I think it's it's a danger of ships passing in the night, right? So um, in... The pharmaceutical industry, um, we've moved away from fundamental discovery. And what we discover are treatments, are are drugs. Um, Whereas in um, academics, at least certainly in the U.S., there's been such a push towards translation that we see a movement away from fundamental research. And that, I think, is the problem. Someone has to do the fundamental research. We don't have enough information yet just to engineer the solutions. So I would vote, you know, for getting us back in academics to very basic research, tackling very tough problems, um, and then understanding the clinical relevance, and stay away from things that um, I don't think are a good use of taxpayers' money, like high-throughput screening and um, trying to uh, make drugs. That's a very interesting perspective and certainly a refreshing one. Both in Europe and in the United States, and probably a follow-up to your your, um, statement there, really we're starting to question the traditional approach to drug discovery and development. And maybe we need a new paradigm for drug development, particularly in the era of stratified medicine. What are your thoughts on that? I agree. I mean, I I think that, you know, we don't want to throw away the baby with the bathwater, as they say, but um, we have been, I think, so enamored with our technical abilities, right? So we can now deep sequence, we can express every gene, we know all the mutations, all the deletions, all the translocations, and we thought that that would lead us to all the great new drugs. Well, we've been at this now for 20 years, and knowing that alone has only rarely been enough. So what is an alternative approach? Well, one might be to start with a disease let's say, acute myelogenous leukemia, for example, and then understand how these genomic changes lead to important pathways and targets for specific 
types of leukemia. Rather than saying, well, FLT3 is a great target, let's study it in every cancer where FLT3 is expressed and see if it works, and then wind up with very little activity at all. So I think starting with a disease rather than a target and then have a drug try in search of a disease, let's start with the disease, understand the biology fully, completely, understand the importance of that target within a specific tumor type, and then we can have a much more linear and, I believe, more efficient drug development process. I suppose, Dr. Hyde, one of the challenges is in relation to the variability within the individual disease in different patients and how we then target that variability. Yeah, so uh, that's absolutely true, but it, just, just imagine how we do it now. We say, okay, uh, this drug inhibits these three kinases, and these three kinases are abnormal in 15 different types of cancer, and then we grope around uh, in extended phase ones or sometimes randomized phase twos to find a signal. That's a very inefficient way to do it. What I would suggest is we start with the disease, um, whether it's leukemia, lung cancer, you, you name it, dig down to the targets first, pathways and targets first, and then go right after those. And I believe as we understand the target in context, we'll get a better sense of the variability from patient to patient, certainly better than the way we do it today. Talking about the patient, we always say we place the patient at the center of both the research and the cancer care process. And that, you know, cancer research is really an influence on all stages of the patient's cancer journey. Do you think this is just a noble aspiration, or are we really achieving something with this patient-centered approach? I don't really think it's true, right? So, I mean, at least to, to a certain extent. So if you start with a target that you find, um, you know, from an exome sequence, um, that may or may not really be about the patient. Um, and ultimately, though, if you start with the disease, a patient's disease, now that now we're talking about the patient. Now, once we have a medicine, uh, an asset that we're studying, then absolutely everything about the patient comes before anything else we even think about. Um, and that's, that's the truth. I mean, that's what we do. But to get from a discovery to a medicine to treat a patient, um, that's a long way off. But I think if we start with the patient and that type of disease that patients experience, um, that's putting the patient really back at the center. I think the other interesting thing is um, uh, the fact that the patients are now so loaded with information, have access to so much information, that they will drive themselves, they'll put themselves in the center, um, which is a good thing. And even, you know, I left practice about five and a half years ago, and I was always amazed at the printouts that the patients would bring in. Um, you know, they were very well informed, and they would pick up things that sometimes even the doctors wouldn't pick up um, and ask, well, why aren't we trying this or why aren't we trying that? The, this is an important paradigm shift that I think will absolutely put the patient smack dab in the center. Thank you very much. You're past president of the American Association for Cancer Research, what role do you think that AACR and AFCO, and on this side of the pond, organizations such as ECHO, EACR, and ESMO, can play in bridging the gap between basic research and bringing that to the patient? Yeah, so these great organizations that you mentioned um, have the ability to convene um, large groups, diverse groups, so uh, as president of ACR, I was asked by then um, head of the FDA, Andy von Eschenbach, to pull together through the ACR a group to work on biomarkers. And it included leadership from the FDA, from the NCI, from uh, research institutions in the U.S. and outside the U.S. to talk about how we better utilize biomarkers to enable predictive or stratified medicine. And, you know, ASCO, ACR, ESMO, ECHO, they have the gravitas to bring all these people together. So I think that's one really important role these societies can play. You mentioned there uh, your involvement in, in bringing together a group in relation to biomarkers. Uh, one of the issues at the moment in relation to 
targeted therapy uh, seems to be that we're uh, unhooking the biomarker from the drug in relation to companion diagnostics, but it may be that we need to rehook them together in relation to things like reimbursement issues. What are your thoughts on that? I think the part of the biomarker continuum or spectrum that you're alluding to are predictive biomarkers, which can turn into companion diagnostic tests, and that can tell you who to treat and, and, and equally important, who not to treat. Absolutely. Right? And um, they have to be linked. In fact, recent approvals, uh, the crizotinib approval, the BRAF inhibitor approval, approval uh, they're excellent, excellent examples of how to link a biomarker to a companion diagnostic test to predict uh, responsiveness. So I think, to your point, they should be linked. Uh, innovation in healthcare is a phrase that's used frequently um, to evoke a system which contributes both to the health of the individual and the wealth of a country or region. Uh, in your opinion, has this health and wealth aspiration been achieved? You know, can we have it both ways? Can we have innovation that leads to better health, ah. but also that also leads to better wealth within the economy? Particularly, yeah. we're talking here, both, I guess, both in Europe and America, in ways in which we can drive economic development. And one of the ways, certainly in Europe, with the Innovation Union, has yeah. been to look at innovation. And obviously, innovation and health is a very important part of that. Yeah, so I, I believe that uh, the future is going to be all about drugs that are markedly differentiated from currently available therapies that me too's or incremental benefit, um, that's not going to fly because that's the kind of thing that really sucks money out of, uh, sucks wealth out of the healthcare system. When you have a drug that's, that, that is a, a me too or an incremental benefit. On the other hand, what drives the health and wealth of a country are drugs that transform the health of people. So if you look what's happening in hepatitis C, for example, with thousands and thousands of patients affected, now that we're looking at cures for hepatitis C and putting people back to work um, in meaningful jobs, that's the kind of innovation that really uh, contributes massively to the health and wealth of a country. Absolutely. I, I'm glad you've sort of raised that point in relation to the Me Too approach because I, I think it is important, and certainly Dr. Peters also emphasized it here at um, ESOF in Dublin, that we really need to look at a, a completely different approach. Um, can you give me some examples of, of how you feel that's going to work, in particularly, I guess, thinking about per, perhaps collaboration in the pre-competitive space? Yeah, well... I think there's a variety of ways that um, this is happening as we speak. I think major pharmaceutical companies, biotechs, realize, and the people who fund biotechs, often uh, venture capitalists, realize that no one's going to pay for a drug soon, um, certainly not in Europe, um, and certainly not in emerging economies. Um, governments can't afford to pay for drugs which have only slight incremental benefit. So the whole starting point has to overcome the so-called innovation threshold. So if it takes 10 years to go from um, a high-throughput screen result or a validated target to a product, you have to plan ahead that when that drug finally reaches the market, that it will be innovative or differentiated enough that someone will actually pay for it. So at that, this point already, that's the way I know we're thinking, and I'm guessing that uh, others in the pharmaceutical industry have to be thinking the same way uh, to stay viable. Just concentrating on the academia pharma intersect again, it's one area of our own journal, The Oncologist. We have a particular section that we started back in 2010 yeah. looking at this important intersect. Um, you've been in the privileged position that you've contributed significantly across this challenging spectrum. Um, what advice would you give for the cancer community here in Europe as we seek to maximize the benefit of this important intersect? Yeah. So I think that it, it, it has to work in two directions. Um, number one, everybody has to have realistic expectations. Uh, I, I recall when I was back in academics, we had, you know, isolated this gene and uh, thought it was going to be really important. Uh, and, and we thought immediately it's going to be worth millions and millions and millions of dollars and everyone would jump up and, and, and bid for it. Well, you know, that's not realistic. 
I think that we have to understand that once a fundamental discovery is made, it takes a team of people with different types of expertise working together to convert it into a product. And I think that industry is certainly reaching out more and more into academic centers um, and to, to partner and collaborate with leading scientists who are making discoveries, and that these leading scientists have to be realistic in their expectations, um, have to understand how difficult it is to go from a discovery into ma to making a drug and um, get to know each other better, understand each other's expertise um, and how in looking for creative ways to, to work together uh, over a long haul because it's a, it's a complicated process. Um, and I think the more the academicians interact with the people in industry and vice versa, um, this uh, knowledge of how we work uh, and the, the skill sets that industry brings and the, and, the, and, the, and the knowledge that academicians bring and their skill set, I think that familiarity and those collaborations will pay off. We have to do a better job at that. And do you feel that we need to look at particular mechanisms maybe that weren't in place before? I mean, certainly here in Europe, uh, through the European Framework 7 program and also Horizon 2020, which is going to be the new funding mechanism for funding pan-European research. Um, both SMEs and Big Pharma are being encouraged to you know, become more part of the, the research continuum. Yeah, no, I think those kinds of initiatives are excellent, are, are absolutely excellent, where for, for the pharmaceutical industry, you, that kind of funding de-risks these very, very early projects. Um, because the failure rate is so high. So that kind of funding, um, they also have it in, in Belgium, for example, in the Flemish region, uh, is really valuable in bringing people together. I'll mention another one that, that I had something to do with when it started and still involved, and that's in the U.S., but I believe it's going to spread to Europe as well. And that came out of Hollywood, the Stand Up to Cancer Initiative, where private fundraisers who want to see acceleration of translational research raised a huge amount of money to fund, quote-unquote, dream teams uh, of people across universities, often collaborating now with industry um, to break down the barriers between one, one university and another and say, look, we're going to put the best people in the world on this project to translate um, a discovery into practice. So I'll give you an example. Uh, one was um, trying to target the PI3 kinase pathway uh, more effectively than it's been done before. And Lou Cantley, um, the discoverer uh, of many of these enzymes in the pathway, leads the dream team with a bunch of, uh, of talented people from multiple institutions. And, I, and they're making great progress. Um, one of the things that I found most striking was um, a self-organizing clinical trials group around the dream team. So these are people who are interested in the pathway, interested in the biomarkers, interested in obtaining the tissue to do these things right, were just organized and attracted to this dream team. So I think the Stand Up to Cancer uh, concept is a very good one. Absolutely. That sounds like a very, and um, something that we could certainly learn from here in Europe. Yeah. One question in relation to sort of access to innovative drugs, there seems to be a divide between access in the United States and in Europe. And I, I suppose I'm talking really about the fact that if you look at the timelines in the United States, the rapid access to innovative drugs seems to be much more quickly achieved than in Europe. And I mean that on a general level. Obviously, there will be individual variations in Europe that will relate to healthcare budgets, etc. Well, have you any thoughts on that and ways in which we might be able to close the gap between the initial you know, registration of drugs, et cetera? Yeah, so it's very interesting. I think in terms of regulatory approval, I think the U.S. And, the, and Europe are probably on similar timelines. It's the, the one step in the U.S. regulatory approval today um, continues to be pretty much in line with reimbursement. Um, in other words, um, it doesn't go through a health technology assessment to say, once a drug approves in the U.S., will somebody pay for it? 
that's under discussion, but that's certainly not the case at the moment. Where in Europe, there's the extra step in many countries, right? The prime example would be NICE, where um, drugs after approval, regulatory approval, go uh, undergo a, you know, a cost effectiveness, a quality of life, a quality a metric uh, to see in, uh, whether or not the drug will be paid for by the National Health Service. And, and that is a delay. Now, the question is, are there ways where industry and regulatory agencies and health technology assessors can streamline that system? I'm sure there are. Um, um, there's a group um, in Europe called Tapestry. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Okay, yes. No, I know who you mean, yeah. Yeah, and they're doing a great job in bringing, uh, you know, the, the parties to the table to before you launch um, a big trial to get everyone's opinion on whether or not or what it will take for this, what kind of result might you need, not just for regulatory approval, but for, for reimbursement. And those kinds of initiatives can really help. I think, I think they are very important, and it's something we actually talked about in a roundtable session here at um, East Up in Dublin on the cost of personalized cancer care. And yeah. To end up, one of the questions I'd like to ask you is, you know, how do we make cancer care affordable when we're in a background both of severe economic um, stress but also governmental pressure, which seems to be particularly on cancer drug budgets. Cancer drug budgets seem to be somewhat of a soft target. Well, you know, again, I'm no expert in this area, so I'd be cautious about saying things that I don't really know about. But from my mind, it's always a matter of priorities. What is the country's priority? Is it the health of people who are dying from cancer, suffering from cancer? Um, how high of a priority is that compared to other things in the in the budget, not just the healthcare budget, but in the budget? And in my mind, as an oncologist, uh, um, this is a common, devastating disease that has a, I think, somewhat of a unique place in medicine because of. Um, the pain, the suffering, um, and the mortality from the disease. So in my mind, the, this is a matter of priorities. How does one want to allocate a nation's budget? And I think for patients with cancer, um, it's a good investment, but that's my own personal opinion. I suppose as well, if you look at it from the point of view that we know from cancer registry data that cancer is increasing, so one might say at the moment that if we don't invest more in cancer, we're building up a problem down the line in 5 to 10, 15 years' time where we're going to have an epidemic if we don't deal with the current situation. Could very well be, yeah. Dr. Hyde, thank you very much for what's been a very stimulating and interesting discussion, and certainly our listenership will be very interested in hearing your thoughts in this area. Great. Hey, thank you, and hope to see you soon.